Yesterday there was a lot of talk about this, and it's in the program. It's sort of a retooling thing. Um, <clears throat> getting from our conventional way of managing crops and soil, well, no matter what scale we're really on, has really stumped a lot of people. And uh, we all have these chronic problems of uh, tillage and the um, consequences of tillage, which are always big in, in anything, whether you've got a, a garden fork or a large tractor, the consequences are pretty much the same all the way across the board. Um, smaller people don't suffer compaction so much, and the bigger people crush everything to death, and everything happens else in between. So uh, there's this old saying out there, you've got to give the land a rest, and you might want to fallow it. Well, where in nature do you see fallowing happening? Nature never rests. Nature is 24-7 for millions of years, nonstop. There's no fallow there unless you get a volcanic eruption or a landslide or a tsunami, and it pops right back almost immediately. And so our agricultural system, uh, that last line down there, it sort of be, you know, in our modern human viewpoint, sort of tends to be apologetic term, this fallowing thing used by the human world to excuse bad soil practices while the land catches its breath from our uh, somewhat mindless attempt to grow food in a system that already had a balance before we came. So we're sort of children still coming back to uh, figuring out how to cruise ahead on nature's terms instead of our terms, and uh, nature, the land really won't have to catch its breath. We might have to catch our breaths catching up with nature. Uh, so this isn't a very amount, large amount of time we have today, but it's <clears throat> designed to give you a few more pictures and ideas, uh, large and medium scale, not necessarily really big scale, but everything scalable up about what sort of goes on. And on the left side of frame here, you see a roundup treated uh, field with a grain crop drilled into it. This is typical across tens of millions of acres in the U.S. and all over where large monocropping or, shall we say, commodity crops are grown. So when people say, yeah, no-till, that's really cool, and then the next sentence is, all you need is a boom sprayer, I say, wait, stop, you're killing something in order to impose a crop. But the damage done by systemic herbicides, and that's the most important issue here, systemic herbicides, systemic fungicides, things that kill the top and everything down below and the other organisms in the soil that depend on that. So if we're biologically farming, we want to kill a whole lot less. We need to understand the weed system a little bit more. There's ways to uh, knock out or impose or so-called the terrible word terminate a crop. How many people heard the word terminate a crop. Well, that's just a nice word for killing with an herbicide. So when they, they talk like that, be, keep your ears perked up. So if you're an organic grower and you want to terminate a cover crop, you can solarize it with a sheet of plastic. You can use a non-systemic herbicide system. You can till, but, or you can smother. Use all sorts of ways to do it. You can relay crops so you don't have to kill anything. As one crop is finishing, another one's already growing in it before the finish is done. So that's an art. That's not very technological. It's, an, it's a high art, but it requires excellent tools to do that. So the bottom frame is a little bit more like uh, rows of squash, a buckwheat strip, and somebody's starting to move away from the uh, Roundup no-till kill drill thing. So this was probably plug planted squashes in a patch of ground, and there's still tillage going on. So there's baby steps going forward for most farms. You know, all at once, sometimes you, it backfires. But uh, minimizing soil disturbance, because every time you uh, disturb the soil, you're going to have the chronic problem of weeds trying to do what nature gives them the job to do, which is to repair the soil surface, put a skin back on it, and heal it. So if we think more like nature, we should be ready before we have a bare soil issue and see if we can sort in crops as rapidly as possible within each other, co-cropping or overlapping so we don't have the reason to wipe the slate clean all the time. Because nature is usually faster than we are, and if we wipe the, wipe the slate clean, nature will stick its people in there as fast as she can, so we kind of need to become a part of nature. It's just going to be crops of our choice and more diverse crops, not monocrops. 
So we set up small farms or large farms, and here's a typical problem in modern agriculture. Uh, this is my tractor, and I'm, I look at the wheels, and I go, this is ridiculous. Look how wide the wheels are. If you drive that tractor over the field without a pattern or a track, you're still losing 50% of your soil surface area to compaction. Now, take a look at a modern farm or barnyard, and you look at all the wheels and all the equipment, and take your tapering, tape measure out, and crawl around underneath there, and you'll start to find out that none of the wheels of most modern farm equipment, or even small farm equipment, are synchronized. All the wheel tracks are either wider or narrower or offset, and most of them continually to get bigger and fatter and larger. We're not really sure who designs this idea, but uh, one notion is, well, a great big wide tire gives you less compaction because there's more surface area under the tire and spreads out the weight of the machine. But modern day machines continue to get bigger and heavier, and no amount of tire sizing up fixes the fact that you still have thousands of pounds of compaction. This is a really tiny tractor. It's only 19 or 20 horsepower. The rear tires are loaded, and so every tire weighs 700 pounds. And you can't tell me that's not compaction. So I got rid of the tires and got some narrower ones. That helps, because I wanted to switch the system I'm working with over to this. I would like to establish compaction-free zones as permanently compaction-free as possible. And sometimes a transition requires driving over all the beds of the field at one time with a plow or disc or a tiller or something so you've got things loosened up. You might have to use a subsoiler to crack the hard pan caused by the conventional tillage, which doesn't take long, two or three years, or one mistake in tillage. If you're tilling wet, cold soil with a heavy tractor because you're impatient to match the calendar for your planting date, it can take years to fix that compaction caused by a wet, uh, unaerated soil. So it's very easy for farmers to defeat themselves. Any questions so far as you jump into this issue? Very small or very large farms can go into raised bed systems. You can do this by hand. You can do it with a, um, a BCS tiller that's got a, a side uh, slung plow, or you can do it with uh, very big equipment. The problem is, is that the equipment is overkill. Even if you had several hundred acres, there's, it's getting to the point where you really don't need more than a 50 horsepower tractor. It would be better to have two or three really small tractors of an older make instead of a modern thing that has to have a brain plugged into it every day. So, uh, Here's part of my answer, and I really uh, go backwards in time a little bit and rummage through junk piles and find free stuff or trash stuff and rebuild it to fit what I want. There aren't even discs up front. It's just a 190-year-old horse-drawn healing, healing tool where two horses would walk on either side of a row of potatoes, and these paddles would scoop up the soil and fold them up over. And I said, huh, you know, I could make that thing work. It's like I paid five bucks for it, right? Just a piece of iron. Put a leveler board across the top. The top frame was completely shot because it was wood, so he bolted that on and put extra weight on it so it would uh, sink down the soil. You can adjust it up or down or in or out. And I have myself, uh, for not too many dollars, uh, a bed maker. Now, you can go out and buy a bed maker and spend a couple thousand dollars with a couple bells and whistles on it. I do not want a bed maker that lays down plastic. I don't want a bed maker that requires the wheels of the tractor to uh, go back for a second pass doing another. So one pass only is really what I'm after, and we get results like this on one pass, a leveling board flat in the top of the bed. And I'm very Neanderthal about my tools. At my scale, I've only got a few acres to play with. And it's not easy to um, convince a large farmer that I know what I'm talking about. But you can usually get around their dooryard and figure out how they can build beds that they don't drive on. But usually they have to change the tires of the tractor, shift the front and rear so the track. How many people have been to Europe and seen track farming? No? Okay, track farming is a couple hundred years old, maybe longer. Track farming is when you 
oh, I know how to get you to think about this. You've seen calendar photos of crop circles, right? All right, some of you have seen that stuff. So here's this bizarre crop circle in the grain, but there's all these parallel wheel lines in the fields. You don't see that in the United States. Those parallel field lines have probably been there for a couple of hundred years, and they've never changed. And that's because the equipment was set up to roll wheels only in one place and never put the wheels where you're going to grow the crop. Don't violate that, that tender, that deep, that aerated soil. And they knew that a long time ago. But that occurred when they had a different kind of equipment. They didn't have fat boy tires on 100 horsepower tractors. They had very, very uh, lightweight, small equipment. Most of it was horse drawn or oxen drawn. And then even some of the, uh, uh, who knows, how knows how far track farming goes. But the efficiency is that you have far more soil that's not damaged by the farm implement. And so we were often uh, stumped by going to the equipment dealer with a tape measure and saying, what have you got that fits this? Oh, nothing. And then you go to another company, and they have a whole different size. And you can't, it's very hard to hybridize modern farm equipment to make coherent farming occur. We have so much incoherence because corporations all compete with each other, and everything's got to be a little bit different. So if you really want to get some help with this and you do farm with some powered equipment, uh, sometimes you have to find a really good machine shop to change your equipment around to make it work. So I couldn't even buy that, this cheap little plastic drop spreader, the way it was supposed to be. It comes with these little tiny dinky rubber wheels that go flat all the time. So you get rid of those wheels and give them to somebody. They're not worth keeping. And then you buy some great big tall uh, garden cart spoke wheels that don't go flat. So you've solved one more problem. You don't have to repair flat tires. And these are 26-inch wheels instead of 12-inch wheels. All of a sudden, I can straddle a three-foot wide bed made by that horse-drawn hiller. And I can still have clearance. And I can put my seed and soil amendments on the top and never step on the bed. It's three feet because myself, I'm not a big guy, and I have people who work for me who are even smaller than me, including the neighbor's kids, and I don't want them tempting to step on the bed as they leap over to grab one thing and then another. Yeah. What happens is, uh, and he has a good question, does it change the, the application rate? Inside is just a simple spindle with little tabs on it. They just turn slower, so it makes a little bit more of a challenge if you've got lumpy and really coarse fertilizing materials or heavy clods of things, which you don't want anyway. So as long as it's really dry and you can pre-mix your seed and your soil amendments, this particular amendment has 16 inputs in it because I want to address every single deficiency I perceive. And I, can, I don't just have to have a soil test. I need to remember what the crop symptoms, what the weed pressure, what species they were. These are pieces of information that build you a recipe when I call up and make that order and spend the money on it, I want this thing to make a wonderful cake. I don't want this thing to go bad on me. So that, and I want one pass. I don't want to go back up and down the bed two or three times. So if it's dry, flowable, and the recipe is complete, I might even put two or three cover crop seed species in with it. And if I want to be more efficient, I'll hang a, a couple of heavy leaf rakes with a hunk of wood on top of them so they scatter the seed into the ground just barely as I pull it along. So I can pull it along if I had a, a powered piece of equipment that straddles the bed, but in this case it's just me <laughs> or two people. And uh, as you can see, one of the efficiencies too of making a raised bed that's got a screen on it, if you have a bed maker with a screen, is it tosses the rocks off to the side and into the wheel row. I don't want to get rid of all my stone, but I want to put it where it's going to be under the wheels. So if I have to work in muddy conditions, I want traction and some levitation so I don't sink into a quagmire. Ideally, bed making for me is do it the season before the economic or cash crop is actually planted. I want to establish a bed midsummer or in the dry part of the year where I can uh, not do soil damage. And I might be able to plant a cover crop that winter kills and inside of the cover crop, we'll call it embedding for sake of that, 
is the crop I really want to have, and it, it's probably going to be a grain crop. So I might have a winter killable oat. I might have a perennial uh, white clover, but I also may have winter wheat and winter rye, or and or, not both together, although that's a possibility too. And so when this whole thing comes up and the winter knocks out the oats and peas or the oats and some other kind of a soft thing, and in my climate, if I put crimson clover in there instead of white clover, the crimson clover will probably be dead. But the only thing surviving in this stable, pre-made bed would be my winter wheat. By the time I'm pretty sure the winter wheat's going to be okay, I'm already planning what I'm going to plant inside of the living winter wheat before it even goes to flower. I've got to have to have a crop plan because I don't want to do this thing where the farmer goes out and says, good, the wheat crop's done, it's, it's harvested, it's combined or whatever, and now we're going to till it all under again. That's the step you don't want to make in regenerative agriculture. So I'm going to probably transplant a fall grain crop, uh, not a grain crop, but a fall brassica crop like cabbage or broccoli. Or I can even do what they call winter planting of potatoes. I'll explain that one later. But that means the bed is now stable. It's its own entity. You're, bu you're building soil structure. There's a little detail. We don't need that unless you've got mechanical people who want more questions. How did I fix that problem? Piece of box beam. And here's sort of a side shot. This one comes from Asif in Pakistan. But, uh, you know, this larger farmer is going to want more like a four-foot wide bed up top. But if you compare the, the contours and lines of this little diagram to flat ground farming, you can see we have increased the surface area that we can work with. And that's enormous because that means more gas exchange, more lateral but not vertical water flow. You can increase the number of plants that you're not going to roll over or step on. And you pretty much uh, minimize damage while you're increasing surface area. It also increases solar exposure, which means if you need more photosynthesis, the shoulders of the bed allow that to be a gain as well. I can't do the size bed in my farm. I did it for years. Now I'm down to a three-foot bed, and it's much better. Inside of, say, the winter grain. Uh, the question comes is how are you going to harvest the grain that's ripening? So you're going to harvest them? Or oh, yeah, the grain. Uh, everything's worth something. Are they going to be uh, cover there's two things. There's two things happening. I planted a cover crop and amended it with fertility, and I put a cash crop in with the cover crop. If you're stacking crops and you're letting nature weed it out with the first hard freeze so that the peas and oats, for example, or are, are dead, but the winter wheat or winter rye survives. And because it's very lightly sown on the surface, you don't have to run a, a deep seeding equipment like a drill or something in there if you don't want to. The, the dying cover crop protects the winter wheat. Let's just pick on wheat for a minute. And that wheat grows up. And in Maine, or in most of New England, we're looking at July to the very first week of August, and we're ready to harvest the wheat. Back up the clock about two or three weeks and have all your transplants ready to go. And this is where we use the term dibbling in or gang planting or something like that. And you can do it uh, if, if, if the grain is really tall and you want to establish uh, just a couple of rows of grain, or you've got a mixed, a non-row crop of grain, it's just loose, it's just like scatter-seeded, so there's no, no pattern to the bed, it's not in rows, then you would transplant the broccoli or the cabbage or whatever, or the um, widowed or kind of fall brassica in there, as the wheat was getting ripe. Now, the whole idea is leave as much wheat straw as you possibly can. The wheat will be tall, It'll be turning color, and you can be harvesting the top off the grain. And at the same day, if you would like, you can plug in another crop. And that means you have to rethink the tools. This is not a mechanized system. This is a hand labor, small vegetable, mixed grain farm type of pattern. If you got into a larger farm scale, you would probably want a transplanting tool and you would probably wait until the grain was combined or harvested off, preferably no wheels again on the bed, and then your transplanter could immediately follow 
the combine or the harvester. The idea is don't give it a break and don't till in your residue. Now, the question is, are you asking whether I'm going to terminate the rye or the wheat? The, the rye. So the wheat is already dead from... Well, let's just say we planted wheat instead of rye. What is it? We'll just say for the sake of the demonstration that we planted winter wheat. We don't want the wheat, winter wheat, which survived the winter kill cycle, to just be a cover crop. I want bread. I want my bread and my cabbage and my broccoli and my carrots all out of the same piece of ground. So we're letting the wheat complete its whole life cycle and we're trying to make sure we have plants ready to plug into that bed just at the same time as we're harvesting a ripe grain crop. But then what do you do with the rest of the wheat that's in the soil? How do you... We don't mess with it. We leave it just where it is. All that grain straw can be laid over a little bit. You can push it over or you can leave it tall. But just make yourself enough room to make sure that the straw acts as a mulch that you didn't have to harvest and redistribute. So it's like taking your grain crop and creating a mulch in place advantage for your broccoli or your fall cabbage. But is it going to continue growing? The grain. Yeah. The question is, is it going to continue growing? No, it doesn't continue growing. Once the seed is ripe, it's done. It's not a perennial grain. Uh, so you've solved a couple problems there. Did I answer that question the way you liked it? Okay. Yes? When, when do you plant the uh, winter wheat? The winter wheat is planted the fall before. When I plant, let's go back to the demonstration picture. Let's say this is late August, and I want winter wheat next year, but it's not enough. I want to build the beds with a legume, I want to amend the beds so that the wheat and the following crops for the next year and maybe two years get everything that they want. And I don't want to till. I want to try to get myself completely divorced from tilling for about two or three years on these beds until I do something like grow potatoes. Now, potatoes are going to have to do something and upheave the whole bed to get at the potatoes unless somebody has invented a potato whistle. Um, <laughs> But this is now a multi-species crop, and it's a multi-timing crop. You are letting the phase of winter-killed cover crops die, but it leaves the winter wheat plants surviving. And it also means you did not have to drill the grain in. Now we're talking about a pretty complex thing here. We're talking about growing three or four crops right on top of each other, but you're not planting them three or four times. You're planting them once. Question, yeah. Um, ideally, in your mind, would this harvester distribute evenly the straw across the bed top? Well, if, uh, if I had my wish, I would have a harvester that would stand up so high, it would only clip the ripe grain heads off and leave the straw as tall as I could leave it. And if I was going to run a, say, a small straddling transplanter like a nursery company would use, like a Holland planter or something, the front part of the planter just pushes the straw down. You're trying to be as gentle as possible and, having, and try to find no real reason why you have to chop the straw. Otherwise, you're going to be buying another piece of machine. You're going to drive over the field a second time. So if you have a way of harvesting the grain and you can also roll the straw down, which is very sometimes just putting a 4x4 four four plank on the back side of the harvester. I mean, you have to be creative here. Anything you can do to save yourself a buck or a thousand bucks would be wonderful. Sometimes we overwork the problem. All we really want to do is make sure the, the winter wheat stems are intact and still fastened to the soil. That's preferred. Anytime you think you have to go back and chop up the straw and change something, you're going to have to add another machine and another trip to the field until we figure out how to make a harvester that does three or four things at the same time. So that's coming, too. These are all good questions. Keep up with the questions. Yes? Okay, let's imagine in these beds that there's uh, about two and a half or three feet of uh, winter wheat straw, uh, preferably a really high-value one like um, emmer or einkorn or some other pharaoh. And Ellie, you could probably inform people out there in the front desk of what we're talking about here. 
And uh, it doesn't, to me, it's going to be looking a little bit messy. We have this sort of idea that everything's got to look super tidy and picture perfect and, you know, Martha Stewartish. And it's not the way the plants think. So the straw is crushed down a little bit, but it's in place. If it's a, a cabbage crop, a single row of cabbage can occupy a 36-inch bed. You try to crowd two rows of cabbage in there, you're going to actually get less crop. Less is more. So we're finding with like a uh, 90 or 100 foot row of cabbage at home on these kind of beds with this kind of system, we can get always over 500, sometimes six or 700 pounds of cabbage per 100 feet. Now I haven't seen um, conventional growers even approach that. And uh, the cabbage root system goes across the entire bed and all the way over into the wheel rows and under the ground. And if it's wet, I don't need to irrigate. If it's wet, the moisture is trapped in the wheel rows where your only zone of compaction is. We also have all this mulch. So once we got into this permanently covered soil, irrigation starts to fade into the back of your memory and you don't have to hustle around. Everyone's screaming drought and you're snoring. It's a wonderful way to um, solve a lot of soil issues. So any more questions on that cycle? After the brassicas, the brassicas are probably going to be cut just, you know, late October. I can plant another grain if I want. Well, the question is, how, what's the sequence of the, uh, what, the cover crop or the grain or the cabbage? The cabbage will take up the whole bed. The leaves will cover sometimes four or five feet across. There will be no sign of soil visible. And the cabbages, you know, they get huge. This is, this is like uh, luxury accommodations for cabbages. Two rows of broccoli you might get away with, but one row of big cabbage is about all it can accommodate. And the cabbage leaves shade everything underneath. So there's no more weed competition yet again. Another question up here. Yes. All right. <laughs> We're wondering how you're going to harvest small-scale grains on bed systems. I this think is, you can use a side. You can do it with a side. You can do it. You can get... There's all kinds of ways to do it with small-scale stuff. We actually borrowed somebody's big uh, landscaper's hedge trimmers and put a bag in the back and walked along, and it, it was so cool. It's like you walk briskly down the field, and this bag suddenly is it was just very heavy, so we had to dump it four or five times, and I said, I got an idea. <laughs> so um, that's, our, that's our humble answer until we uh, either... Um, solve the trade war and get existing miniature combines from China here, but sadly enough, most of them are decrepit things and they're very difficult to repair. And they're really not that reliable. So this is the, this is the bottleneck. Small-scale grains on organic no-till systems where you don't drive over your bed. Yes, your hand is up. <clears throat> Uh, you could, or you could put just a homemade crimper right up front, just before. Sometimes we're absolutely, um, maybe comically lazy. We'll take an old piece of um, drain pipe, highway drain pipe, and uh, rig up a spoke inside and a rope and just roll it with that. But we, if it's actually not in the way, there's not much point. If it gets in the way and your transplants look like they're going to get buried down there, you're going to get eye, your eyes poked out with a piece of straw, certainly crimping it down, no problem. Sometimes that's what you would like to have a miniature combine or harvester do, but, you know, this, it, it has to be a practical tool. So you can crimp it. You don't have to buy a big, complicated crimper. You can just make out of a drum and some sticks bolted to the sides, and it goes thumping along, and the grain flattens. Yes, Clovers, always building clovers so I don't have to buy any nitrogen. I like that a lot. <clears throat> You've got a couple of um, choices for clovers. Here's the problem with grains and red clover. Red clover on a wet year is so aggressive it'll outgrow a grain crop. And you'll be harvesting a lot of leaves and other debris with your grain whose heads might be lower than the actual grain. I mean, uh, might be lower than the actual uh, red clover. Even though the red clover is a marvelous at building soil, it complicates grain no-till or companion planting with that. So we go with micro white or Dutch white clover, and we can even build beds where the clover is permanently there. 
and we can put more than one grain crop into that bed with clover. Yes, Ellie? You get much more nitrogen if you keep your clover alive all the time. The clover would rather be left in place. This thing about plowing down or tilling in cover crops, I think, has got to be reconsidered. Uh, it's like taking one, one step forward and almost two steps back. Because soil just, it, you can see people who do this relentlessly. They might get a beautiful green cover crop growing, and then they do a lot of damage to the soil to simply incorporate the cover crop in the soil, thinking, oh, it's going to rot in there and make my fertilizer. Well, let's think about this a minute. You just created more soil disturbance. The cover crop is, is dead, yes, and it's going to rot, but you've got bare soil, so you've got oxidation. You've broken the crumb structure that the cover crop built for you, and you're back kind of at square one. It's like building a bridge and blowing it up and building a bridge and blowing it up, or shoot one foot and then the other and then the other. And this is sort of how people sort of stay in static or chronic organic agriculture without making that leap to, uh, you know, regenerative, where, I mean, where the soil has a break from us humans, so it can regenerate itself. So keep the clover in place. If you want to plant into clover, that's where we get the cover crop of clover established, and then you can scalp the clover off really close to the ground, or you can use a clear plastic tarp and solarize it, but it won't kill the clover crown. It'll only burn the leaves back. Immediately plant your grain, or transplant your vegetables into it, and up it comes and the clover is back, being your helper. All you did was set it back a little bit to get it slightly out of the way. Bigger crops like dry corn, uh, you can put dry beans in clover. They don't actually compete that much. And you can put small grains in a permanent clover field or clover bed system. But you have to figure out a way to manage the clover. And it's one of the reasons why we sometimes suggest smaller growers uh, purchase some micro white uh, clover, which is about 50% of the size of regular Dutch clover, which might reach a foot tall, and the other stuff only reaches four to six inches tall. It's like a, la a landscaper's ground cover that's always generating nitrogen nonstop. Even after it's frozen in the ground, it's still working for you. Very, very slowly, but it means there's no more bare soil. And these very tight clover crops are planted on these now increasingly permanent beds suffocate most annual weed conditions. So the annual weed seed's still there. You're always going to have a weed seed bank, especially if you've been gardening or farming for any number of years. It's always increasing until you stop growing weeds. And then the weed seed bank has no real excuse to sprout. Another hand went up. Oh, how to plant in clover is the question. Clover, if you're transplanting into clover and your bed is tender and soft because you have not stepped on it, wait until the soil is warm and dried out a little bit. Don't do it in really cold, wet clay conditions. And you can use a gang dibble, a narrow shovel blade. Uh, if you're direct seeding very small stuff, you might want a slice cut. How many people uh, use an earthway seeder? It's not going to work in the clover. If you uh, take that plastic wheel off the front and you buy a steel, round steel coulter, like a big pizza cutter, and find a way to re-glue or refasten the cog of your earthway onto the side of the coulter and put it back in the front. I have a picture and I didn't bring it with me. And it looks a little bit unique. You might get laughed at. But the coulter is steel and heavy and you can keep it razor sharp and you only want it to slice in there maybe an inch. And then you still keep the little earthway shoe on there, and it opens up. That is what you call an opener disc. It opens up that clover as long as it's really sharp, and then the back wheel stays just away because that closes it. So you can dribble in wheat. You can put in carrots. You can put in beans. You can put uh, just about anything in there. If you want to do something really big like seed potato, don't cut your seed potato. Wait till the soil's warm cut a hole and drop a whole small potato all the way down in. And you're going to say, what am I going to do about hilling potatoes? You already made the hill. Don't redo the thing. If the potato plant perceives that there's no hard pan and also perceives that there's a gas exchange, it means oxygen, nitrogen, and CO2 are all the way, top to bottom, full depth of the bed, there's another reason to build raised beds. You've doubled in some cases, even tripled, 
the amount of aerobic soil. When a crop perceives anaerobic conditions, its root system goes to the very top because it has to breathe just like you and I. We all share these same things. Those microbes in the soil uh, die out if they're suffocated from compaction or water logging or any number of reasons. And the plants follow the microbe population. So we want aerobic microbes as deep as we can get them, and the potato plant knows not to put tubers on top if it's comfortable. Potatoes growing in their native habitat is a wild potato. Do not put tubers on top of the ground. And here we are in modern agriculture forcing potato plants to behave differently than their messages. They're just trying to save themselves. So the deeper we go and the more space we give the plant, the less work we create for ourselves. And we will say, well, what's your spacing on the potatoes? One row of potatoes in a 36-inch bed, that's plenty. If it's a 48-inch bed, maybe two. Don't cut the seed. And people say, well, why not? I'm increasing my uh, spread on my seed potato. It doesn't happen that way, actually. So our, our most successful method, I've got uh, pictures later down the line here, of potatoes was to cut the seed rate roughly in half. Don't cut the seed, plant it six to seven inches deep, and plant it in another crop. So we don't plant potatoes by themselves anymore. We put a potato row down the middle of a bed, and we put chickpeas, field peas, buckwheat, and we might put, um, we don't usually try to find a couple of extra legumes in there. One, you, know, you had lentil seed, and it all worked fine. What happens is they don't compete with each other, they actually augment each other. As the legumes and peas, for example, start to go to seed in a potato row, they're finished way before the potato is ready to come out. So the peas are already dying off, and you've got pea seed hanging on the pods, and the leaves are shriveling up just about the time the potato is coming into bloom. When the pea plant starts to die out, it starts to release a whole lot of extra nitrogen in an amino acid form because it's the body of an organism dying. So that's protein coming apart in the soil. It's not leaky. It doesn't smell like manure. And it doesn't invite pests like aphids, leafhoppers, Colorado beetle. Instead, it's had a nice, slow, steady trickle charge of protein. And the potato plant's got, it's already there. Dinner is served. When the potato plant's hooking new tubers under there, it's really hungry. In a commercial system or an organic system of typical hilling the potato, the potato is usually side dressed just to get the crop up to a really good size standard. Here's a case where you probably don't have to do any side dressing and you certainly don't have to hill. So not hilling potatoes, um, that's a paradigm shift. It's, uh, you know, depending on what part of the country you live in, you'd be shot and run out of town, but uh, he doesn't hill his potatoes. We can't have them here. You've got uh, many things, but preferably uh, lacy-leafed, small-growing legumes. And I put buckwheat in there for a couple reasons. I would like to attract beneficial insects that would be predatory to my potato leafhopper, to aphids, and to the Colorado beetle larvae. And the, the uh, predatory insects are not going to come unless you invite them with something for them to eat. They have two things in the life cycle. They want sugar and meat. The meat is the larvae of the insects that are damaging your crop, but they also have to have a lot of carbohydrates in their system. So any kind of a flowering plant that is co-cropping with your crop is to your advantage. I've never seen the co-cropping of buckwheat damage a potato crop at all. It looks funny. Actually, it looks kind of nice to me these days. But uh, peas, lentils, chickpeas, um, AC green fix, or chickling vetch, they sometimes call it. Those are all great companion plants for potatoes. And we've been able to convince a few really large farms to pull that off. This is, this is a potato field, but it's on its alternate year. And this is a, a big leap of faith for this farmer who usually makes sure there's not a green thing showing. And it was very hard to convince him not to plow this down at the end of the year. There are 10 species of cover crops here. Nowadays, 25 or more species of cover crops would be more appropriate. Questions? Yeah. 
come in <coughs> once you get <coughs> once you get eight or more species of plants growing. Now the mycorrhizal fungi come into play. Even with one, a little bit comes. But why not be more diverse? When you want an immune system to build in the field, and you're building humus at the same time, and you have some economic crops, why not have 30 or 40 species of beneficial fungi that can be mycorrhizal and some won't be mycorrhizal? Also, every type of cover crop, and his comment is good, um, every type of cover crop and any annual crop, anything that's alive, puts out exudates in the oil, in the soil from, you know, carbohydrates are formed in each plant in a little bit different way. So the photosynthesis byproducts from the sunflower or the peas or the oats, and then down in there there's some flax and stuff like that. They're all different kinds of soil foods that plants, long before we existed as a blip, plants were uh, well aware that they could not get up and walk away when things got uncomfortable. So plants cultivate the soil organisms to suit their desires. And in order to do that, they make a deal. They say, I'll feed you microbes, and if I don't like you kind of microbes, I'll shift my chemistry, and I'll make a different kind of exudate because I want more beneficial fungi and maybe a different kind of bacteria. And so that complexity is so far beyond what we know today. We're just beginning to open that chasm, that huge door of every plant has multiple tools in its box to culture its rhizosphere, its root zone. And so when you put that many cover crop plants together and you put an economic crop before or in it or after it, you've solved so many problems. All the way in the back. I want the seed to set. Oh, I want this place to go crazy. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to buy more cover crop seed. I would like it if my cover crop seed uh, was actually on already on pre-made beds and hills. This farmer, of course, what do you do in conventional potato farming? You hill, and you usually have one row of potatoes down one hill, and your surface area is a really poor relationship. And then you've got tractor tires running on a conventional potato field, roughly eight t 18, sometimes in a wet year, up to 20 passes with heavy farm equipment on the same potato field. So just under the, the potato field, it's harder as an iron. You cannot get a penetrometer to go in. It might have uh, five or 600 pounds per square inch of solidified hard pan, which is another reason why the potatoes get, a, get hilled. You see the vicious cycle. The potato says, we hit a sidewalk. We can't put our roots down, so we're going to put our tubers up top. The farmer knows this. He goes out and tries to hill the potato. The hilling is not successful because there's so little soil left that potatoes squirt out of the side of the hill, and then they Sometimes if they get it together in time, every few years they'll hire or rent or buy a huge soil ripper, but it usually takes less, not much less than 200, sometimes 250 horsepower tractor to pull a ripper through a typical conventional potato field. So that shouldn't be necessary. So an awful lot of things in agriculture are make work. No, I wouldn't call it a weed. Anything that regenerates from a cover crop seed is my friend. So um, what I can do when they come up in the spring is I can let those come all the way up and do what they call mulch in place farming. And we'll, we'll address that shortly after a question back here. This, this farmer, because he's got, uh, this is an 80 acre field, he drilled it in with a seed drill on bare soil. And that soil was bare after potato harvest the year before. The field looks like death because they kill all the potato vines with diquat or Roundup. Think about that the next time you have a French fry. It's in your potato. So uh, this is drilled in. If you were just using a cone spin spreader or you had a manure spreader and you dumped your seed mix right in your manure spreader and let it fly, you'd get the same effect. If you don't want to get the seed into the ground, you can just run a disc over it if you really want to. But you don't have to get too complicated to get this kind of a, a cover crop to go. What was nice about this farmer uh, is he granted that uh, he was very itchy to plow the whole thing under and make all that green disappear. But we walked through the field during a field day, and this is middle of September, 
and the tiny clouds and clouds of tiny insects were there. And he says, I've never seen so many bugs. He says, are they, gonna, are they a problem? There, there were no beneficial problems going on. All of them were, were good bugs. Uh, you could still dig a hole in the soil out in the very middle there, and you could find Colorado potato beetle larvae thriving, thousands of them. But what we were trying to do is to get them to shift from conventional to organic and get them to stop killing his cover crop. We didn't want him to terminate the cover crop. We wanted winter to do it for him. So half the field he did it his way, and the other half of the field he left just like this. And he was just determined. He said, should I mow it? No, do not mow it. I'll pay you not to mow it. So he didn't mow a few acres. And the snow came, and it flattened it. Next spring, on this side that he didn't mow until under, it was solid with worms, and that scared him. He said, there's something really wrong out here. <laughs> you know, it was great, you know? And um, a guy came up from one of the alternative soil labs in Maine, and we had the field day, and he said, let's go count worms, you know? So we dig up a square foot of soil on the tilled side. We found two, maybe three, and they're feeding on the residue that was tilled under. There's nothing else for them to eat in this case. On this side, we actually, the hard pan started to dissolve. In one winter, a hard pan starts to give away because he did not till in the cover crop. And the biology started to ramp up. And we were finding up to 25 or 30, in some cases, two species of worms where he'd never seen any in his lifetime. The other thing we had him do was shift just one fertilizer. We said, do not put muriat of potash on switch over to sulfate of potash. And I said, well, why would I do that? Sulfate of potash is much more expensive. I said, because your myriad of potash is killing your soil. It's making it into a highway, concrete highway under there. So these little experiments come very hard and very slow, lots of kicking and screaming, but they do work. Do you know how long it takes the soil to heal after Roundup? It can take a really long time. But there are biological packages you can actually buy now that will absorb it and decompose it. It's not easy. It's a very, very tough chemical. It's the carrier in the Roundup, the surfactant, that's worse. When Roundup break starts to break down, it gets more poisonous, not less poisonous. And that's a long, long backlash cycle. It's kind of like the Fukushima effect. Once it's there, it's not going to be, uh, not going to be an overnight fix. It can be resolved. It can be um, held back if people use extra carbon and humates. The trouble is it keeps killing things. And the plants that get used to it, we all call weeds. So we, now we have all these Roundup Ready resistant crops. So uh, there's several different systemic herbicides used. We're just familiar with Roundup because it's got a high public and political profile. But there's Paraquat, there's Diquat. Um, dicamba, you start naming it. All of them are incredibly and hideously toxic to the soil, to animals, to people. Nobody can wear, you got to wear a moon suit when you're applying any of this stuff. You just have to. There's no way around it. And so what is that doing to your food supply? So Roundup pickled farms can be resurrected, but it takes a really, really aggressive, um, usually it's a biological package with enzymes and humates. To, to trap it and start to dissolve it with enzymes so the biology or the microbes in the package can finally eat it. But it's a really tough chemical complex to take apart. So bioremediation for uh, Roundup-treated farms is now big business, really big business. It's actually hard to get a tool uh, that's cheap enough or even allowed in this country where you can go out and do a field test to test how much residue you have. You send a sample to the lab, it's not cheap, it's a couple hundred bucks. If you want to test for glyphosate in your food, it's, you better hide that little tool in your pocket. These are tricky problems. Potatoes every third year. What else is going in? Wheat or oats or buckwheat. Okay. So those are all monocrops though. Uh, I think what's happened now with this field, this is a three-year-old picture, I think what's happened now is uh, this is now, after three years, it's considered organic soil. Uh, the residue herbicide that the guy did use was not a Roundup, but it was um, 
Diquat, which is almost as bad. And uh, <clears throat> some of the plants really suffered for it at first. This cover crop, some of the species could not grow. They would come up and curl over and dry up. And others did really well. It, took, it was delayed, and it came along after a lot of rain. Uh, so this is roughly three and a half, four feet high. And uh, if this was grown on raised beds instead of on flat ground, and the winter had just laid it over, and you had a no-till planter, that would be a dream, a wonderful dream, to see someone pull that off. So a few people are doing that now. If he was going from this cover crop into potatoes, the suggestion would be to no-till plant. There are no-till potato planters. They do exist, but not in this country yet, unless you do it by hand. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, probably... Uh, getting too impatient about equipment here, but if you could do that, say, on a small scale, and it means that the no-till uh, potato planted into pre-made beds with this kind of stuff on there are going to be potatoes that you're also going to want to put more legumes and more companion plants with them. We'll always make a big package. Don't just do a single item if you can afford it. And uh, <clears throat> likely, even in high, high uh, insect pressure country like up here, the Colorado beetle will not be interested in the potatoes planted in a bed companion planted with living, other living plants. We see this all the time at our place. We know that um, Ron Tech in Virginia, Virginia Tech 30 years, Ron uh, Morse rather, he did this 35, yes, 35 years ago now. He could plant um, organic raised bed, no-till, and he could put whole seed potato down in the middle of just even just as simple as a winter rye crop. And the rye was still there, and it would be crimped over. He wouldn't till it. He wouldn't mow it. And then the, rot, the seed potato would go down the middle of the bed, and it would, as the potatoes would come out, the rye is there, so it's pre-mulched, so there's no weeds. There's no need for irrigation. But there's something about that rye and potato relationship that the Colorado beetle could not get near. It was absolutely out of the question. So the, the companion field next to it, which was done conventionally to show... The usual, typical Colorado beetle, leaf hoppers, and aphids creamed those crops. Came right up to the row that was a, a mulched, a rye mulched cover crop row with the potatoes growing out in it. And what have you done? You've changed the chemistry and the internal biology of the potato plant so it's no longer food for a pest insect. And if the potato beetle should venture in there and lay its eggs, its larvae will probably die because there's too much sugar in the potato plant. So that's a really great piece of research people did. Potato beetles are not meant to eat sweet leaves. And when you have really efficient photosynthesis without leaky nitrogen, the sugars, like the BRICS index, goes up past the point where some insects can tolerate it. Same thing with aphids. Aphids couldn't tolerate it. They want uh, nitrate salts in the leaf. They don't want sugar. They make honeydew out of their bodies, but they don't want to be in that kind of territory. It's not meant for them. Okay, we already have that figured out pretty good for you. <laughs> we do keep track of these experiments. The idea was what's the density of the cover crop in, in the potatoes? The seed rate for the potatoes is cut in half, for one. The spacing is way apart. It's not 9 or 10 inches. It's 16 to 20 inches apart between potato plants, which counterintuitively gives you a bigger potato crop because you allow the potato plant some elbow room. It's got a companion plant that's feeding it. The cover crop mix is usually less than 20 pounds to the acre. If you want to go a little higher, you can, but choose smaller statured legumes. You know, so a small legume would be a chickpea. It stays sort of low and wide and bushy. And the, uh, the other legumes, like the peas or the chickling vetch, have little, they're fairly viney. They're not, they're not shading. And they get tangled up in the potato plant, which is all the merrier, really. But we found that uh, 20... 25 pounds over that was unnecessary because you're only planting the cover crop seed or the companion seed right down the middle of the potato row at the same moment you're planting the potato. It's not afterwards. It's not before. And potato planting is usually done at roughly six inches. If you're doing this on a, perm in a raised bed and not flat ground farming, you would put the potatoes down that six or seven inches but you'd have another seed planter that's following right behind the potato planter and pushing that 
cover crop seed in, only about an inch, inch and a half. Yes? What is harvesting the potatoes? Conventional potato harvesting equipment. It digs the whole thing up. Everything's dead. Potatoes are up on top. All the debris and the vines are all over the place. Now, why do people kill? What's that? Doesn't it get like really clogged up? Does it get clogged up? If you, if you do something different with potato culture, you don't have a clog up problem. Almost all conventional potatoes are killed because the vines are so heavy and big and vegetative because they use so much fertilizer. And it's a soluble fertilizer, so it keeps the plant in a very vegetative condition. But I haven't found a market for potato leaves yet. So the thatch and everything? The thatch, it can get a little thick, but remember, the legumes have already died by the time the potato's ready to dig. So you have these wispy little brown and yellowish twigs. There's not a lot in there. You don't want to put like a whole um, thick thatch of uh, companion plants in the rows between the potatoes because then you might get to the point where you have so much thatch a conventional potato digging machine can't make it through. There are potato diggers that can handle that, but they, they're usually made in Italy. They look different. I'll make a deal with you. I have one. <laughs> I have a Ferrari, or a uh, well, it's it's a, an extraordinary potato digger. But my potato digging and lugging and selling days are probably over. Um, I wish I had another field to go into though, because I'm in love with potatoes. <laughs> Any further questions here? There's a lot of details. We're stacking. This is not monocropping. This is complex very closely timed sequences. After a while, it'll seem like you can do it in your sleep. Yes. Yeah, the downside of that is if you grow a slug-prone crop, like leafy greens, especially lettuce or something like that, or spinach, and you try to get it into a clover bed, you're going to have some trouble. If you put the leafy greens into a bed that's winter-killed straw and it doesn't have live clover, you're probably farther ahead. Uh, the trouble in northern climates is we're cool and wet sometimes for a really long period, and we have an occasion for mollusks, snails, and slugs to really get cranking and out of hand. Uh, we solved that problem a little bit with our neighbors who ran ducks. And so uh, it took their 28 or 20, maybe 30 ducks at one time. They would come out and march down a little line, just like the book says, they always followed exactly the same path, and they'd spread out into the gardens, and they didn't do any damage at all to any of the crops, except my high bush blueberries. That was almost unforgivable. Uh, they love berries. Um, but they sucked up all the slugs and all the snails and produced pretty amazing eggs. And that was roughly an acre of vegetables to 25 or 30 ducks was a slug-free system. So that's a different kind of intensification, quack intensification. Yeah, depends on your tools. If you want to grow a companion plant that's going to take up a lot of room on that row of potatoes in a 40-inch bed, that's a lot of surface area that you might as put some, well put something in. But will it, one, interfere with your potato equipment? And if it gets out of hand, can you knock it down without knocking down your potatoes? So you might have what a, would be a, a skip tooth uh, roller or something. This is going to be homemade stuff. This is MacGyvering your way through agriculture, which I know you're good at, <laughs> building something that doesn't exist. Um, but if you had a very low growing cover crop that you wanted, and the trick is, is the bed integrity such that the potatoes do not need to be hilled? So if you don't need to be hilling, and you don't have a hard pan down there, and that soil is actually aerobic, more than a foot deep or so, chances are not too many potato varieties are going to be interested in putting a tuber on top. If you think they're going to put a tuber on top, the next game is grow a really aggressive cover crop right alongside of the potatoes. And when it gets to be the time that you think those potatoes are going to need to be hilled, don't do it with dirt. Just cut your cover crop down with a sickle bar or some way of folding it right over. Preferably fold it over. Don't whack it apart with a weed whacker or mower, but 
push it over so all the stems are left full length. So you're doing sort of like the Swedish potato culture where it's all mulched. But it's a, it's a problem because you, um, by the time you're ready to hill or mulch in place your potatoes, you have to have a way to get in there and knock that stuff down without crushing the leaves over on your potato. It's mostly a mechanical gizmo that you're going to make because that does not exist on the market yet. Me, I would probably say, okay, I'm going to um, create a roller with a paddle up front that will squeeze the potato leaves in and crush the cover crop down. And when I, get, when I look behind me, the potato leaves fall back over top of the cover crop. This is farmer engineering stuff. Um, I've done that many times by hand, but I would love to see someone make a tool if I don't get to it that would allow them to mulch in place a uh, plant that normally would need to be hilled. Yeah. This guy has a tremendous history of inventive farming out on Martha's Vineyard, so nail him, corner him. He knows what he's talking about. And so he didn't have to invent a machine. He just got some labor coordinated properly, and it took very little time. And that's a pretty sizable piece of ground to manage that way. But it sounds like it's the same thing. It's not potatoes, but you're mulching in place your broccoli. And peas, right? Yeah. Anything else with the peas? Uh, peas and oats. What a marvelous combination. New England succotash, we sometimes call it. <clears throat> this is oilseed mustard. There's another cover crop planted inside of it. And uh, it may or may not come up. So this was actually a uh, pretty desperate piece of soil. The actual soil depth here is less than 12 inches, a solid rock ledge under it. This is a four-foot shovel handle. So this mustard is roughly six feet. It turns out this mustard crop is the only thing left on our farm after all the goldenrod and all the asters and stuff went by that the bees had for forage. So there's a set of beehives on the other side of this thing. And they worked it really hard up until the temperature went down the teens and it pretty much froze the mustard in place. But this was a really successful cover crop because the roots of this type of brassica, just like a lot of brassicas, go straight down to the ground like a long carrot or radish root. And they broke up what little soil I had into a nice crumb structure and left me with almost a weed-free condition. And when mustard is grown this way, which means this was my primary crop, I put all my money for amendments into the soil for the mustard seed. Into that drop spreader thing, everything's in that, including the mustard seed. Now, if this oil seed mustard, which uh, you know in a commercial catalog would be called Mighty Mustard Mix, but it's Junsia, which is East India mustard. And uh, in the West Coast, it's grown as an oilseed crop to replace diesel fuel. So, and it's a little bit high in sulfur. In the Near East and over in the Asian countries, the Junsia is pressed as cooking oil. It's, it's probably the most popular cooking oil. Um, it can taste really good, too. But I wanted biomass. So if you didn't fertilize or feed and treat this like it was the, a co sweet corn crop or something, the Junsia would probably not get more than two feet high go to flower early and die off early. But I wanted this to go like it had no idea winter was coming. I wanted biomass. And I knew that if I, uh, from experience, if I put all the amendments into my cover crop that I think my next crop is going to need, my amendments are far more efficient by doing this. So uh, that's what happened after the winter knocked it all down. I didn't push it down. You can see it's sort of going squirrely all different ways. Here and there, you're going to see a dandelion, a little bit of quack grass. But the weed pressure in here was formidable until I did this. So this was, for me, a really great way to convert hard sod, full of troubles, full of weed seed banks, perennial weeds and everything, and convert it in one season to something I can plant garlic, or I could wait to uh, do something else in it. But this is just, just coming out of winter now. Uh, oddly enough, we've learned to do spring planting garlic in Maine to some success. Uh, and on some varieties, it's been just as good as fall planting, but it doesn't like uh, compacted soil. So this was part of the, the effort here. This also sets me up for transplanting from a plug without having to till, no tilling. 
Yeah, I know, because people think you plant garlic in the fall. I, I sometimes yeah. do in the spring now. But this sets me up for planting any one of dozens of crops. Without, as long as I don't disturb this mulch, I'll be in good shape. Now I could also, right here at this moment, we still have frosty nights. Most people know what frost seeding clover is all about. This is the opportunity to frost seed clover. Really good opportunity. There was a hand up back here. Yeah. Uh, and before you planted the oilseed radish, did you plow? I mean, what was it was tilled. It was just raw field sod, full of wire grass and everything you could think of a old hay field would look like, or a pasture. So this is one of the tricks to converting like a wild field back into a, a vegetable farmer's field. It's taking a really difficult sod and putting a very aggressive cover crop. I would prefer to have a, uh, in the future, I would prefer to have uh, a less, a ratio of less oilseed mustard and some buckwheat and some sorghum sudan. Because the quack grass didn't get completely knocked out by the mustard, but sorghum sudan is capable of doing that. Because the exudates from sorghum sudan are toxic to almost all other grasses. And then it's an annual, it's a tropical annual. So what would happen is the sorghum sudan would be protected inside the mustard, but the buckwheat and sorghum would die maybe a little later than if you didn't have the mustard. The mustard is the only one that can hang in there a really long time. If I was really creative and I wanted to grow a grain crop, just as the frost started to hit this, I could broadcast a light dose of clover seed and a winter grain in here. And what would happen is the winter grain would sprout down inside the canopy of the dying cover crop and you wouldn't be able to see much. Next spring, you'd see it. You would really see it as almost like a, a light lawn, but it would be rye or winter wheat or something like that, or maybe an einkorn, without screwing with the field. You're not tilling, you're not drilling, you're over -sowing. It's called over -sowing. So that's one method. Another is called mulch in place. So getting mulch in place uh, as a tool into farmers' minds is very difficult but highly successful if you get your timing really good. You can go all the way up to this stage or a little bit later and you can sow your seed on top and not let winter knock it down, but you can go ahead and use a sickle bar mower. Do not mow it with a rotary mower. Cut it right flat to the ground with a sickle bar mower, again, leaving everything long. And then the grain and the clover, the clover will be delayed and might only become a tiny plant and some of that seed won't even sprout until next spring. So this is September and October you might do that. In our neck of the woods, we're learning we need to plant winter grains earlier, more like August. So you might actually be in this situation because I sowed it in August. This would be better for a mulch in place grain. If I still have this much residue in November and I put grain in there, the grain is not going to sprout. Five minutes, she says. Good. Stage hook is good. Uh, so a mulch in place scenario here was if you take this to November and you wanted to plant a winter grain, you would throw the seed out over the top, preferably with clover, and cut it flat, drop the, uh, the cover crop on top, and the grains grow through. This happens by mistake all the time, so now we need to intentionally make mistakes over and over again so we get our timing right. After a while, it gets to be so, such a no-brainer that, uh, and you can also, um, Instead of growing a winter grain, let me back up a minute. If you, if you cut this that late, like in November, when the bees have had their chance, if you cut it that late, you can, use, you can plant spring oats, spring wheat, spring barley, which most people plant in the spring, but you can put those grain seeds inside of here and flop this stuff down on top. And again, the spring grains are sown in the winter like it was in Roman times and they grow up through the mulch in place. So The mulch protects them from the temperatures Right. Somewhat. It's too cold for it to sprout, but it's protected. The only enemy of the mulch in place thing, since you're not putting seed in the soil itself, is rodents. It won't rot, because the ground's going to freeze. It usually just swells up and freezes into the, onto the surface of the soil, right under a thick thatch layer. So this is a very much of a do-nothing farming program. Do, do less, get more. And uh, 
I know we're almost out. We'll leave it at that slide. Any questions before we take a little quickie break? Yeah. Where's the lunch break? Which is the end of the show, right? Yeah. Ah! In the what? Your mustard to, to sow between the it's a spin sower. You know those little spin spin planters? Broadcaster. Broadcaster. <laughs> yeah. I wade through where I can drive a very, very distant path and get about 25 or 30 feet of spin of a seed on it. Doesn't the seed end up on, on the surface of the plants? Falls all the way through and goes right to the ground immediately just rolls right off. It's very hard to find any cover crop seed hanging except if you've got a cup of a, a little cup of a leaf you might see a clover seed. But almost always overseeding the ground that goes right to the ground almost <coughs> close to 100% of it falls through. Which is nice. It's handy that gravity works in our favor that way. Now it sounds like the whole gig is up here because I'm used to talking all day. So we'll scream through a few other pictures. There's an SRI plot trial being started with plug tray grains. Over here is the SRI plot trial uh, going at SRI spacing, which means uh, less plants makes more crop. So I've got two kinds of wheat, four kinds of uh, hullless oats, two kinds of hullless barley, and a couple of oddball things. This would be what you call very tight companion planting on the right, carrots crowding right up to a sweet potato bed. Rice is inside the sweet potatoes. Uh, here is uh, the rice in Maine. Uh, Hollis intensified oat trials. We were trying to select for an oat that would tiller more under an SRI system. Some of these oat plants achieved about 20 stems, which is pretty unusual for an oat. And the stems were almost solid. There wasn't much uh, hollowness inside. That's what we want when a solid stemmed highly tillered plant, so the yield, and the yield was terrific. And um, there's another highly intensified, shoehorning in everything we can possibly grow in a small piece of ground. But it's not crowded by numbers of plants. It looks crowded because there's fewer plants growing to fulfill their phenotype. Uh, here's the side shot on the walking path between the dry beans and the different oats. The oats on the left that are really tall and collapsing is because the seed weight is so high in that group. Dry beans here. How many people grow dry beans? <clears throat> Our dry bean pattern is uh, two rows, no closer than two feet apart, maybe even three part apart for some varieties, and one plant per foot in the row. So that's roughly one quarter or less of typical planting rates. And uh, we have a threshing machine. Here's the bundled uh, SRI trials ready to go. So, you know, this is really small stuff. This is less than a quarter acre. We have more dry beans and grain off of that little plot than we can use up in two years. There's two of us with all the company that shows up. We don't have much of this stuff, but we do have these, these miniature threshing machines. There's a, a local county fair or a state fair, um, Mopka's usual common ground fair. We've invited farmers to come with their grain and thresh their grain. Where'd you get that machine? Yeah. What's that? Where'd you get that machine? I made it. Part, part way made it. We hired somebody to build part of it in Sri Lanka, and then we added all the other parts here, like the engine and the wheels and the other things to make it work in, in our environment here. And then we got a seed cleaner together and did that. But what we liked about this sort of situation is in an afternoon we could harvest two or three grains and be milling bread that night, <clears throat> milling for bread the same night. And we could go from one grain to the next without cleaning anything out. <coughs> the equipment's not a combine. It's so small and light you can, that's it. You just puff and blow and, and the rest of one grain is out and another one's in. So if you adjust the air properly and the screens properly and the grain is really dry, this is key. We want things really, really dry. Don't thresh wet grain. It'll just frustrate you. But it's dry enough now to mill into bread. So that was less than 12% moisture. And we keep doing this. Here's our dry bean threshing method. Very high tech. 
We can do this on two or three acres worth of beans. Just use a riding mower and tarps as a threshing tool. It never splits the beans because the tarp is on soft grass and the riding tires, mower tires are soft rubber. And then the rest of it is just passing it through two screens and a big fan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Throw up and fans. It was very great. And then the bean, the bean chaff is the mulch for the next overwintered crop. <clears throat> that particular crop was uh, Eclipse black bean. You can do it all from here. Uh, every, even very small farms can grow an amazing amount of grain if they're into that kind of thing. I'm just sort of stuck in grain. There's a solar grain dryer. Don't have to use fuel. When the sun shines, you can dry down not just grain. Now we've learned we can dry fruit and vegetables. We add a second fan, and so, we, so it doesn't build up so much heat that it roasts or cooks your vegetables. Uh, the first try, the temperature in here went 150 degrees. That's too hot. We added a second set of fans up front without rebuilding the machine. This one will dry two tons of wheat about 3% down in one day on a sunny day. So that solved some huge problems for small farmers who couldn't do small grains, would lose it to mold. This is that same kind of solar dryer with hoops put inside of it, so when you turn the power off, it doesn't collapse. So if there's a rainstorm or a lot of wind, this makes it more stable. This is a one ton of wheat in a much smaller dryer, actually, from two weeks ago out in northern Maine, just before we turned into winter. So when a farmer sees that moisture uh, problem solved in a single day, they get really excited because that usually takes two to three weeks with fossil fuels. <clears throat> so we, we test all the grain. There is a Ukrainian-made, only one moving part seed cleaner. So we're, we're, our interest is in dressing small-scale grain production in the U.S., so that somebody with as little as a quarter acre could be serviced. And it's all on wheels. It'll move. Villages or towns or communities could own this stuff or whatever. And instead of having this, you know, 4,000 bushel West Steel tank, we, we're trying to we even figure out how to get the grain dryer to fit onto that so the solar dryer will use that and they can get rid of the uh, propane gas. Uh, we think that on a bad year in Maine's grain, which is roughly 40,000 acres, one-third of the grain crop is lost to spoilage after harvest. We can't afford that. And uh, probably most of it's just due to bad timing. Uh, for the organic growers, it's weeds first is the issue. They haven't figured out how to do crop rotations without weeds. But we know we can do it now. We don't need an herbicide. Timing has to change. And none of them have good drying equipment, and very few of them have uh, affordable cleaning equipment. So grains are different than vegetables. There's th three or four extra steps involved with grains over, say, harvesting potatoes or carrots or onions or cabbage. Here's another type of grain cleaner, one moving part. These two last two grain cleaners are what they call laminar airflow cleaners. Incredibly efficient, incredibly quiet. And I know it's lunch, so we'll, uh, anyone who wants to leave the room, please, don't, worry, don't wait on me. Uh, <clears throat> this is a bagging table. What do you do when the grain's falling out? You, don't, you need three arms. So we set up a bagging table and use cheap waste baskets without a bottom. You put a hermetic bag underneath because hermetic bags don't allow the weevils and the meal moth to get in. And you can stand up and you can load your grain into buckets or bags from under the table. This is SRI applied to carrots using a stale bed method where you use a flame weeder or vinegar and soap, an intensified bed with the yields are roughly twice what the U.S. average carrot yield is or high carrot yield. Very easy. What's that? The method is stale bed planting, but using the rice intensification thinking, Fewer carrot seeds per square foot made a much bigger crop. We don't want to weed carrots. We don't want to thin carrots. So we would plant the carrots in a bed after the weeds came up. And just before the carrots sprout, you toast them. You can use a flame weeder or vinegar and soap, or you can toast those same weeds with a clear place of a greenhouse plastic that's left on for one day. And you can move it further forward and get a second day out of it or something. But 
This is a, about a 90-foot bed, and uh, I don't have the numbers up here, but it was good. Norman has the numbers on his website. <laughs> We've shared a lot of stuff over the last few years. But uh, a lot of farmers won't grow carrots because they don't like thinning and they don't like the weed pressure. And a lot of farms will hand weed three or four times at the same time as also run a cultivator between the rows. As soon as you do that, you're going to have more weeds. So we plant the bed and force the weeds to grow. We want the weeds up at least an inch before we plant our carrots. Does that sound upside down or what? The idea is to make sure the weeds are the first thing to get wiped out by your organic weed control practices. But do not step in the bed and don't run a cultivator or you'll just have more weeds. Yes? What kind of seed are you using? This was just a, a, a cluster of, um, come on now, uh, that. Whoop, back. Homemade gang cedar. Cheap. These are the, some of the most frustrating cedars to, to use because they're so cheap they don't hold up too good. But, you know, you do with what you got sometimes. And, uh, oh, okay. Any questions about that while people wander off for lunch? There's no, in this, there was a, there was a, um, a light winter killed crop. It what didn't look good, but it was pretty light because uh, earthway cedars don't go through cover crops well at all. I could do a lot better if I had a different kind of cedar. The idea was to have as high a percentage of number one carrots with the least amount of labor. And a nice thing about on this kind of a system, nobody's digging anything. You just pull. The carrots do not require digging. So the broad fork or the harvest fork is no longer needed. It's uh, resting in an old age home. <clears throat> Carrot washer, root crop washer. We, uh, this is your $7 model of root crop washer that replaces a $2,600 barrel washer. We can wash as many root crops per hour with this simple piece of scallop net in a tub as people are doing with a carrot washer that has to go around the clock all the time. So we use hardly any water compared to a barrel washer. We don't get covered with mud and slop. And the dirtier the water gets, the better the carrots get washed. Because the, wa the heavy, dirty water becomes denser, and those micro abrasion particles clean the skin of the carrot faster. And then it comes out of the dip tank in the net. It's used about 50 pounds for a load. And you drop it in a tub of clear water with a little bit of baking soda so you don't get post-harvest mold. Throw it up on a table like the potatoes to dry in the sun so the skin is completely dry but not shriveled. And it goes into the cellar immediately until it's sold many months later. This is potatoes intensified using SRI thinking. These rows are five feet apart. And this is the yield we got. You can see it was pretty thick with potatoes. This was a really, we weren't looking for weight. We were looking for quality, but we got the weight anyway. Thank you. Good. <clears throat> that says it to sell. You know, <laughs> I don't know why this happens. <laughs> they all, all showed up with hearts on them. <laughs> This is a gang dibbler. A few people uh, yesterday asked about gang dibblers. You don't cut your potato seed? I never cut potato seed. Just whole. I just put them in whole. I don't put really big ones in, fairly small ones. What do you do with the big ones? Big ones we eat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't buy much potato seed anymore. I go out in the field and flag plants. I put a flag on an individual plant that was starting to look really promising. When we dig that plant, and if it still looks fantastic, that's our seed. We're looking for all sorts of things that we want to improve the genetic expression of the potato. So if you buy a 50-pound bag of potato seed and only five or six plants are promising, those are very promising plants, and we don't really want to buy potato seed every year, especially organic potato seed. And um, sometimes you, uh, you discover some exciting things. It's not truly a seed when you buy potatoes to plant. It's not the, the fruit that's in the seed ball. It's a fleshy tuber. 
So when you plant seed potato and you don't cut it, and you also turn it green just a little bit. This is a Zeef again. Turn the potato green in the sun or under a cover so it's moist but get some uh, photosynthesis on it. And that potato will come out of the ground twice as fast as one that hasn't been allowed to green up. And if you cut and it's wet, cold weather, you might rot your seed. They're just the whole potato seed? Yeah. You could throw it right out in the lawn in the grass and it'll just do what it naturally does, turn green and make the buds swell out. And that's okay. If you, long, if you don't mind picking up potatoes out of the grass to plant, it works just as well. If it's a healthy lawn, you may have pre-inoculated your potatoes. So conventionally, potato growers cut their seed, treat it with incredibly harsh fungicides, and it rots anyway. Mix castor oil with dish soap, three oil, one dish soap, warm until it's creamy and looks like uh, wet mayonnaise or, very, or hollandaise sauce, and then you put it in a backpack with really warm water, and you spray it on. You can use an, an organic-type soap, but particularly an organic castor oil is available on the market if you want to do that. And rodents abhor castor oil, except for rats. Rats are semi-human. Um, they've learned to do anything. Uh, I haven't gotten the castor oil to repel beavers yet, but I have a beaver problem. Yes? Castor oil can also heal almost anybody. Yeah, castor oil is medicine. I sprained my ankle, I put castor oil over everything. Yeah. All right, I know we've gone way over, probably worn everybody's patience out. Thanks. <clears throat>